Hello and welcome. My name is Charles Zona and I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's Macron Group webinar. Our presenter today is Joe Rebstock of Macron Associates. Joe is going to tell us what constitutes a knowledgeable scanning electron microscope operator from simply being what he refers to as a knob tweaker. Uh, Joe is a senior research scientist with Macron Associates and has nearly 40 years of experience. He is a co-instructor for our basic scanning electron microscopy course, a course he has been teaching for over 15 years. During that time, Joe has seen his fair share of knob tweakers and has been able to transform them into knowledgeable SEM operators. Joe specializes in particle analysis, polymer imaging, electronics, and medical device analysis using SEM, EDS, and WDS. Joe will field questions from the audience immediately following today's presentation. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Macron Group website under the Webinars tab. And now I will hand the program over to Joe. Thank you very much, Chuck, and welcome to everybody that's able to join us here today. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of information for everybody to take back and find useful in uh, their particular operations. So uh, the topic today is on scanning electron microscopes. And our question is, do you think you are a scanning electron microscopist? Well, let's find out. In today's instruments, many of the functions that are being performed can be done in part or in whole by under computer control. Now, this is uh, uh, able because the manufacturers have supplied a number of what they called recipes with the uh, software and the instruments. And these uh, recipes, if you click on them, will set up the instrument for certain conditions like the column accelerating voltage, the spot size, the current in the beam, the working distance. Everything is already pre-programmed for you. So with the advent of recipes, and these can also be developed in-house, just about anybody can learn to turn on an SEM and acquire information. The amount of training that any one of us receives just varies considerably. If we're using, uh, uh, looking at a work environment where we're using the recipes, then we just need enough information to be able to turn it on, acquire the information, know whether or not maybe it's running correctly or not, but then uh, produce the results and we're done. Uh, also, if we have very strict protocols, uh, maybe we have a legal case that everything we analyze uh, of one particular material or type of testing needs to be done under set conditions. Uh, any uh, requirements then for the job uh, will vary uh, greatly from uh, place of business to place of business. So therefore, if we can operate that SEM according to our protocols and our requirements, we are scanning electron microscopists. But if we have to operate the SEM outside of those conditions and parameters, uh, if we don't have enough training and experience, we very quickly become frustrated. We're trying to develop new procedures, investigate some new areas. And too often, or very often when we get students, what we hear from them is, if you have to operate under those situations, where do you start? What do you change first to make it uh, work better for you? So here we can end up, any one of us could end up what I call a trial and error knob tweaker. If we have enough experience and have been given enough training, then we become the knowledgeable operator. And there's lots of benefits to working at that end. So if you're starting out, what you want to find out is what type of SEM do you have? You want to know the make and model of that SEM. Is it a tabletop? Uh, you're going to have very limited parameters and controls if it's a tabletop SEM. You go to the standard type SEM, which operates in standard vacuum conditions. You're talking 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus six tor. Uh, you have a lot more controls available to you. You have uh, what's called a variable pressure uh, SEM or low vacuum SEM. This is just an extension of the standard SEM. It allows you to look at samples now that are com uh, may not be fully conductive, where the standard SEM, you only have one option available. The sample either has to be conductive or you have to find some way to get around the sample charging. So you can put uh, non-conductive samples into your SEM and the variable pressure and you can dissipate the excess electrons that are building up in the sample. Uh, you also have what's called an environmental SEM. There's not a lot of these out there today. 
Um, matter of fact, over all the years we've been teaching the course, never had anybody come take the course that actually had one. Uh, so they have very limited use. It's been a slowly developing field. It has some very specific uses, but if you wanted to look at something like a tissue of materials and you wanted to maybe heat it or cook it or something like that, re-examine it, you can look at it in different stages, but not a lot of demand. The latest SEMs and the ones that have the greatest uh, resolutions to them are the field emission SEMs. And these are now available in both the cold or thermal emitters. So if you get this information together, what it's going to tell you is you will know some of the limits and capabilities of your SEM and what you can actually expect to get from it. You also want to find out what the electron gun or electron emitter is in your SEM. Uh, many of them are just going to be the hairpin tungsten filament. This is just a tungsten wire. It's about 125 micrometers in diameter. Uh, you also have a lanthanum hexafluoride crystal, which is referred to as a Lab 6 or a LBG. Uh, you have your field emission guns, and these could be the cold or the thermal variety. This is just a very fine, sharp tip tungsten uh, needle. So just a quick comparison of uh, two of uh, the uh, type of emitters. And your, this is the uh, hairpin tungsten filament and the uh, field emission guns. Your lab six will kind of fall in the middle of these two. But uh, the uh, tungsten filament, as we mentioned, was about 125 micrometers in diameter. But the area that's going to be producing the electron beam that you're going to get off of it is only 20 micrometers in diameter. That's going to be the diameter of the cloud or uh, beam of electrons that's being emitted. If you go to the field emission gun, it is considerably smaller. Now we're talking about an area on the tip that is less than five nanometers in size. So with the smaller diameter beam at the gun, we can keep it finely focused. And when we get to the sample, we can get fantastic resolution out of it because it is super small. So the uh, magnifications uh, are available often on the uh, uh, standard type SEMs, the LVs, it is up to about maybe 300,000 X and achievable maybe at about a nanometer resolution. This is only if you have everything perfectly aligned and you have the world's best uh, prepared sample. So uh, you might really anticipate getting something more on the order of you know, between 25 and 75,000 X in most cases. Uh, if you go to the field emission, they have the capability of going to a million X. This is, takes a lot of effort to get to. Uh, you have to have a room that is well protected, no uh, emissions, uh, electromagnetic emissions in the field, uh, anywhere near the instrument, otherwise it will distort your image. But you can achieve resolutions in, uh, of less than uh, a tenth of a nanometer. You're talking now, you're down into the angstrom range. So, other things you should know. You want to find out what detectors are on your SEM and where they are located. Where they're located is going to play a big factor in interpreting your data. So do you have a secondary electron detector? And if so, how many? Where are they? Do you have backscatter electron imaging capability? Uh, typically, this is going to be at what's called a compositional mode, designated maybe as BEC. But if you have another uh, detector right adjacent to it, you can add a uh, condition that's called shadowing. So that's a BES designation. And it actually adds quite a few features to the image. It's very, very good. And there is also the BET, which is looking at topography. These detectors interact with one another. Signals are added and subtracted to get the image, but it gets you a lot of useful information. You also want to find out if you have an energy system on it to detect x-rays or wavelength. You could have both. Where are they positioned? So after we turn on our SCM, we have it under vacuum, it's ready to go. The first thing you want to do is saturate the filament. Well, some people have said we don't saturate filaments. It's just on when we hit the button. Well, we recommend that you go into your gun and you actually turn the uh, current that is in your filament down when you go to end your session. You, when you bring it back up, you come start at zero and you're not shocking this uh, filament. You can, it's, it, it's very delicate. So also, it also forces you to recheck your saturation point because as the filaments are used, they wear. So therefore, your saturation point may change over time very quickly. So it won't be the same. You may think it is, but your image is going to degrade on you just by turning it on and off. 
you want to find what's called the uh, heating current or load current or a filament current setting. The terms are synonymous. The same manufacturer will switch between instruments. Uh, they may use the abbreviation for it or maybe even the acronym like load current might be designated somewhere in your software as LC. So to saturate, we we'll use our little diagram here, our graph. The amount of current that is going into the uh, uh, filament circuit is uh, represented by our X scale. So as we put current into that, it heats the filament. And it initially it's being heated very close to the post where the tungsten wire is attached. As we turn that current up, more heat is generated. It'll eventually get up to maybe from point A to point B. And what we're looking for in their monitor is the image starting to become brighter and more intense. So you're seeing brightness and contrast showing up. Well, after point B, we heat it a little bit more. The image starts to get darker. I've had people actually say they stopped at the position B. You don't want to operate here because the beam is not focused. You're getting a false emission here, a false saturation, because the uh, electrons are being emitted from the two sides of your uh, filament. They're, they need to come off the tip, and in order to get the tip the hottest, you have to turn the current up even higher. So now you go through uh, position C, D, and E, and you get up to F, and all of a sudden now your image is maximum brightness. It's not changing at all. This is now saturated. You may be oversaturated, and you don't want to be here either. So in order to find out if you're oversaturated, start dropping the current and look for the least change in brightness and intensity. And this is what's called a shoulder to the plateau. If you run your instrument on the shoulder, you can extend the life of your filament uh, you know, many, many hours. So it will operate longer for you. Now, if you need better resolution later on, you may have to come back here and go back to saturation. So after we're saturated, we need to align the beam uh, as far as how it's passing from the uh, emitter down to your specimen. So it's, it's called a column alignment. And one of our students in our class came up with the acronym of GAS. They said the first step in it is to align the gun, go all the way back to the filament. And what you want to do is uh, adjust your shift and tilt controls. It should be designated at somewhere in your system. Uh, such that the uh, beam is coming off the very tip. You want it to be on the center, not off to a side in either direction. You also want it to come straight off and go straight down the column. That's the tilt. You do not want it striking a wall somewhere along the line and getting a black image. So you need to have it going right down the column and go through all the openings all the way down. The next uh, adjustment is the, what's, uh, the aperture. We'll say a little more about that in a second. But uh, for the aperture, you want to be uh, at best focus. You want to find a small feature, and you want to blow it up to higher magnification than when you were at uh, the adjustment for the gun. On the gun, I like to use low mag. So now I've got an image maybe an inch or two in size in the center of my screen. I'm at best focus, and I look for a control that's called Wobbler. And what it does, it's an electronic circuit that is going to focus and defocus above and below the sample electronically. And what I want to look for in my image, the feature that I'm observing, is it should symmetrically go in and out of focus about itself. It should not move on the screen, you know, left, right, up, down, or anything in between. It needs to go in and out of focus symmetrically. And the best type of feature to use for this is actually going to be a sphere. It works great. So now we adjust the aperture, center it, uh, and some people may or may not have this. We'll get more in that in a second. But... Uh, you center it and then turn it off. The wobbler will not stop at best focus. You will have to readjust your best focus because the next step, we're going to adjust stigmation. And this, what the stigmation is going to be is the shape of the beam. The cloud of electrons going down the column when we get to the sample, we want it to be circular in shape. If, there's, if the uh, beam is not circular, if it's uh, elongated in one direction or the other, it's going to be elliptical. And what will happen is there will be preferential stretching in our images. So we need to remove that, and there should have a set of controls somewhere on your uh, keyboard or in your software that are X, Y, 
stigmator controls. So you bring both of those into the best focus again. And remember, as you use your SEM over time, continue to check best focus and continue to recheck uh, the stigmation in your image. The SEM is somewhat unstable, especially in the first 30 minutes of operation, and these will change frequently on you. So continue to recheck them. You set them one time and you're going to eventually uh, become very blurry. So now once you've done your uh, column alignment, there's a couple of quick tests you could do. Here's the size of the feature I usually use and about the approximate magnification for a first cut alignment. So I'm about an inch or two in the center of the field of view with my particle and about 5,000 X. If you take your uh, spot size, which is your beam current, and it changes the diameter of your uh, cloud as you turn it up or down. So if you change a couple clicks over where your current setting is and then go below it, what you want to observe is the image and how it remains positioned on the screen. Does it move left, right, up, down? If it does, how much does it move? Typically, I'm doing my alignments or final alignments three to five times the magnification I think I want to use to acquire images. So now if I'm three times greater than where I'm going to get my image, if I have uh, some movement of a millimeter or two, I don't worry about it because when I back off and go to the magnification I plan on using, that little bit of distortion is not seen. So if it does move, the adjustment is in your gun. Go back to the gun, recheck your saturation, recheck your shift and tilt controls. The other control, is, or the test rather, is going to be the change your focus. A few clicks above best focus, a few clicks below best focus. And again, watch your image. If it moves, then you need to make another adjustment. This adjustment is going to be back at your aperture. And of course, anywhere along the way, keep your eye on the stigmation. And stigmation is just stretching of the sample in uh, a, a, a preferential direction. So now look at our particle here. We did a saturation, and the image on the left represents the particle after uh, before the gun alignment, where on the right now we have uh, the alignment completed, and we now can see a lot of structure and detail. Just very quickly, a cutaway of a column. Uh, the gun is near the top. Our condenser uh, uh, coils are in the center here in that green area, and just below it is the location of your aperture. And the SEMs that we use, this would look like a, uh, a representation of that aperture. For some people, <coughs> it may just be a box. You may not even have this control available to you. Uh, either it's not on your SEM or it is being corrected for electronically. It will not, this, uh, most of ours, we're going to use, use a uh, physical adjustment, but we do have some that are electronic. So here is our aperture. And on this particular uh, unit, there's multiple numbers here near the top right. You see 0, 1, 2, 3. These are the positions that you can put this aperture in. What's going to happen is when you move from one to the other, all the way on the left in the circled area is where there is uh, the end of the uh, aperture that is in the electron beam path. Go down below that, and we have a little flat piece of metal represented here. And it's pointing at it, and it has the 100 micrometer symbol below it. This is a piece of uh, molybdenum metal, and this is the actual working part of the uh, aperture that's going to get our beam where we want it. And uh, there's holes cut in it, and they're shown by the dots that are represented there. In the uh, zero position on this aperture, the, uh, uh, it is totally removed. There's no aperture in the beam path at all. In the number one position, the hole that is in the beam path is 20 micrometers in diameter. And you want to use a small diameter aperture when you're trying to acquire high resolution imaging. The uh, largest position is the number three in this uh, in, uh, aperture, and it's 100 micrometers. Here we want to get a lot of electrons down the column uh, all at once, and we want to try to collect elemental data. So we're forming the EDS spectrum or collecting uh, WDS counts. The uh, position in between the number two position is 30 micrometers. And uh, this is the one the uh, manufacturers put in, and it's kind of nice intermediate between the two. So you could do some nice imaging with the number two setting, as well as doing some good elemental work. 
don't think that the number one position uh, is always going to be the smallest hole. I've seen in the same manufacturer it be the opposite way. In one instrument, the number one is the smallest, and in a different instrument by the same manufacturer, number one's the biggest. So check it out. This I've thrown in just as a quick example to make you aware of a little problem that you could come up with. It's inherent in the instruments. This is uh, uh, the aperture, uh, the aluminum uh, metal piece. And uh, there are three analysis done here near this one hole. And uh, of interest then is the amount of carbon that is turning up here. All three positions turn up a fair amount of carbon and the heaviest areas closest to the hole. Well, what big deal is it if there's a little bit of carbon on the surface? None. It doesn't make any difference. But this carbon is due to uh, oil vapors that are in the vacuum. And these are coming back from your pump. You're talking 10 to the minus 5th, 10 to the minus 6th tor here of vacuum. So you're able to pull some of the vapors out of the pump back into the instrument. And they, those vapors get up in the column and they interact with the beam and they get burned on all these surfaces. <clears throat> well, you can run into a problem when this deposit starts to build up at the periphery of your hole. It does not build up symmetrically. It'll become irregular shaped in a big hurry, and it'll really be blocking your beam. You're going to suffer a lot of degradation. This aperture does need to be replaced periodically. So if you don't have a PM routine from the manufacturer, someone at your facility should be routinely looking into this to change it. As the beam then interacts with the sample, it generates multiple types of radiation signals. Uh, and the ones that we're going to be interested in for the work that we're going to do in the SEM, uh, off on the left, we have a couple here. It's called the Bremster Long Radiation. We'll see more here in a second about these. Uh, and then our characteristic X-rays. We have our secondary electrons uh, shown on the right along with the backscattered electrons. But you cannot overlook the fact that you're going to have heat. Anytime the beam interacts with the sample, <clears throat> you're passing electrons from one position point to another. So when you get electron flow, you always have a current, and it's going to generate heat. It's going to be possible to uh, burn your sample. Uh, you could maybe melt it, cause it to change form. You can even vaporize some sensitive samples. So consider your heat. And the way to get rid of some heat is lower your current. Take a look at now at uh, where our usable signals are coming from. As, uh, <clears throat> as our beam comes down to strike our surface, the, it's the purple cone right up uh, near the top of the image, and it rasters over that small area at the bottom of the cone. The electrons do not stop at the surface of your sample. They actually penetrate into it. They're impinging into the material being analyzed. And then once they're inside, depending upon uh, the material you're looking at, they begin to swell. And they may swell immediately or not quite so quickly as this example is showing. And within the, air, the area then of the excitation, uh, you have all your signals of interest being generated. They're generated throughout the uh, excitation volume. But secondary electrons have very low energy. And the only ones that are really useful to us that we can get out of our sample and back to our detector are those that are very near the surface. And uh, this may be on the order of maybe just 10 to 50 nanometers into the sample. So we end up with a very nice uh, image quality here. Or potentially, we could get very good image quality and a lot of surface structure and detail. The best area or the most usable area to get your backscatter electrons, the bulk of them are coming from this green area, and uh, uh, they are of higher energy than the secondary electrons, so therefore they can get out from a deeper depth. We've got some examples for this. Uh, and then below that, the bulk of our x-rays are generated in that purple area near the bottom. Uh, these signals are generated throughout the excitation volume, but the bulk of what's coming out that we can get to our detectors that are usable to us are in these designated areas. So you have to consider this uh, excitation volume and shape because if you were to try to analyze, uh, say, a laminate and you're looking at it in a cross section, you may be rastering on one of the layers in that laminate, but because of the subsurface uh, swelling in the uh, volume, 
uh, you could be getting uh, signals coming from adjacent layers. So you have to understand the interaction between the beam, the specimen, and your detector. Now, how do we form uh, their signals? Well, we have an electron coming in from the beam, and any time an electron's path is changed, uh, it'll slow slightly, but it gives off a little bit of energy. And uh, if uh, we have a very small change, uh, we get a low energy X-ray. And these are not characteristic or diagnostic. The, uh, the change is random. And therefore, this is what forms the background in our uh, uh, EDS spectrum. Uh, if it uh, bends just slightly, these are referred to as inelastic electrons, where if it turns, if it's caused to turn at a much higher angle, uh, then these are the elastically scattered electrons. And our backscattered electrons are actually elastically scattered electrons. It's beam electrons going into the sample and being ejected straight back out. Over on the right side, in our diagram here, we have an electron uh, from the beam coming in, and it strikes an, uh, an electron that's orbiting one of our atoms. It uh, actually dislodges it, and the dislodged electron from the specimen is now our secondary electron. We can collect these if it's ejected uh, from an atom that's near the surface, and we get very good uh, image uh, generated from it. Uh, the uh, electron from the beam then is elastically, inelastically scattered, and it goes off and uh, interacts with other parts of the uh, specimen or it gets absorbed. Now, once we knock the electron out of orbit, that atom is unstable, and it will stabilize itself in short order. What it will happen is an uh, electron that's orbiting in another shell will be pulled from an outer shell to fill our void. And it cascades and continues, but electrons from outer orbits must have higher energy to maintain their orbits than the inner electrons. So therefore, what happens to that energy? It's shed in the form of an X-ray, and the amount of energy that's in that X-ray now is diagnostic and characteristic information. It'll tell us what shell it came from and what element it came from. Just a quick example here of EDS spectrum. We'll come back to this later. But uh, if you look at the uh, area, let's say, in between about uh, 2.5, uh, where the molybdenum peak is uh, uh, there, and then the uh, just over 5, where chromium peak is, you can see uh, what the background uh, uh, in our spectrum is going to look like. And these will taper off to either side. But anything below our peaks now the, our, our, is, is, is background, and it actually gets subtracted out in the calculations. The peaks then are representative of the elements that are uh, in our sample that we're analyzing, and the peak intensities uh, are dependent upon the concentration for each of those elements. Now, you can have multiple peaks for chromium, manganese, iron, and nickel. These are because these x-rays are coming from different uh, shells or subshells. So uh, for the uh, two nickel peaks we're looking at here, right around uh, oh, seven or a little over seven and a half, and then a little over eight and a half or just short of eight and a half, the first nickel peak is called your K alpha. The second peak is called K beta. Well, those x-rays were generated in the K shell, and the uh, electron that filled the void came from one orbital away to form the K alpha, and it came from two orbitals away to form the K-beta. And there's also uh, nickel L X-ray lines down here at the far left. So there's a number of uh, X-rays that can be generated at different energies from each element, uh, anything over about silicon. So now, if we have an image acquired, we've gone through and done a, uh, alignment, and it's fully saturated, uh, sample is well prepared, uh, but we're unsatisfied with the image now that we're seeing. What can we do as the operators to improve that image quality? Well, one of the things you can do is change your accelerating voltage. As you increase the accelerating voltage, the diameter of your beam actually becomes smaller. Well, when it becomes smaller, the result is you get better resolution. But don't get into thinking that better resolution always equates to better image quality. We'll see just the opposite in a minute. 
uh, we could change the spot size, which means the beam current. Uh, as we turn our beam current higher, <clears throat> now our beam diameter gets bigger. Well, if we turn it down for imaging purposes, the diameter will become smaller. That will give us better uh, <clears throat> uh, resolution, and we can also get some better uh, image quality out of that. We can change the working distance, and this is the space in between the end of the column and the focal plane of the specimen where we're currently viewing. So it's, it's measured in millimeters. Uh, we can also change the tilt, the way the uh, specimen is uh, uh, configured to interact with the beam. Uh, so if you can uh, tilt it just a few degrees sometimes, you can get an amazing effect as far as image quality. we got some examples here. Uh, also want to take a look at our objective lens if this is available on your instrument for adjusting. Uh, as you change this, uh, the size, then you can itch affect the image quality. We'll show some examples here. First, I will take a look at what happens to our uh, excitation volume if we're looking at the low atomic number material. The typical shape is, you know, let's say we're looking at a piece of carbon. Uh, we get what's called a teardrop or pear-shaped excitation volume. We're rastering the area at the surface between the two arrows, but then it impinges into it, goes down a little ways, and then starts interacting with the electrons and protons in the atoms of the specimen, and it swells. Well, if we go from low accelerating voltage shown at the top to a higher accelerating voltage, maybe 5 kV to 30 kV, the excitation volume merely gets bigger. It swells. It gets deeper and wider. So always keep that in mind. If we take a look at a higher atomic number of material, maybe a metal, uh, basically what happens is the upper half of the excitation volume we were just looking at in the carbon sample uh, basically goes away. It gets cut off, sliced away, because there are so many protons and so many orbiting electrons. As soon as the electrons from the beam strike the surface, there is almost instantaneous interaction and scattering. So the uh, excitation area, again, is at, you know, on the surface. It looks like it's in between there are two arrows but we're getting x-rays generated from pretty good uh, distance away. An example of uh, the penetration of the uh, uh, beam is uh, shown right here in a uh, TEM grid. Uh, the, the TEM grid on the left, this, this image was acquired at 1 kV. This has a uh, organic film cast on it, and uh, it's just a, you know, the TEM grid, if nobody's seen it, it's just a, uh, an array of squares, open squares, and the carbon films or organic films are placed there so that you can put small particles on the film and not have it fall through, so we keep it there. So then the, uh, what you're doing is looking at specimens in the openings between the grid bars. Uh, on the right, what we've done with this image is we've increased the accelerating voltage, and this is now up to 5 kV and the beam is actually penetrating now through that organic film. It was quite thin, some uh, micrometer in thickness, so uh, initially it was being stopped or almost stopped, and now at 5 kV we're going through it. We can see through the grid squares, and we can see small particles on the surface of the substrate uh, in between the openings. Also, uh, looking at, uh, uh, here's a paint chip and the penetration effect of the beam on this paint chip. Uh, on the left, it's 2.5 kV, and we get very nice structural detail of the surface. We can, we can see small features on that surface. But if we uh, increase the accelerating voltage to 20 kV, the quality of our image has degraded. Well, at higher kV, we have a smaller diameter beam. It should give us better resolution. Well, resolution is not image quality. What is happening is we're impinging too deeply, we're getting too many signals from too many planes, and we lose the structural of the surface. So uh, if you were looking for imaging, you're going to back off and go to that lower KV. If you're going to do elemental analysis, you're going to maybe need this higher KV. So the optimum conditions here for imaging are not the same as our optimum conditions for uh, doing our elemental work. Uh, so we're going to want to try maybe another uh, accelerating voltage and see what happens. But first, let's take a look at it. it's the same secondary image on the left at 2.5 kV. 
and we switch to, from the secondary detector to the backscatter detector, well, we don't hardly see a particle. You can barely make out there's something there. There's just not enough signal under the other conditions. We could change something to improve on that, change maybe the brightness contrast, or maybe change the amount of number of electrons going into the sample without changing the KV, just to create more signal and uh, start to bring this particle out. But another way to do it is just change the uh, accelerate, or ch yeah, change our accelerating voltage. Well, we've gone from on the left from 2.5 up to 10 kV. We can see some very nice structure in the backscattered image, and this is the compositional mode. So we see some different brightness contrast levels showing up. Uh, and if you are doing elemental analysis on these, you're going to want to examine the different brightness contrast levels to make sure uh, exactly what's going on because in your backscatter image. Uh, the compositional mode, the uh, actual brightness contrast uh, is determined by two factors. One, the composition in any given point, and it's an average of the, all the elements that are in that point, or the topography or the surface structure of the sample. So you could actually have black holes in the surface of this sample, and uh, there's just no material there, but nevertheless, it's got a different brightness contrast level. If we go over to the right on the same paint chip, we boosted the accelerating voltage now to 20 kV, and we have these bright features showing up. In their little particular paint chip we have here, we now have some lead particles that are associated with our paint chip. They're not on the surface because we couldn't see them at the lower kVs. So therefore, they are subsurface, or they may be embedded within or at the opposite side of our paint chip. We could turn it over and find out by looking at it and see if we get a better uh, secondary image of it. In the secondary image, they were not a bit, uh, there was no indication they were even present. So you need some different conditions. Use your different detectors. Here we want to take a look at what affects your depth of field. Uh, we have a sample on the left and right. Uh, both these images are at 25 kV. We'll keep the kV the same. Uh, but if we have, we're looking at a spring, uh, right now the top of the spring is 10 millimeter working distance away from the column, and the spring is 4 millimeters uh, in thickness as far as top to bottom, side to side. It's being viewed with a uh, aperture of 100 micrometers, so the largest opening aperture. How can we improve this image so that we can see the top of the spring and the bottom of the spring at the same time? We want to increase that depth of field. One of the ways is to change the working distance. We actually lower the specimen further away. Here we've gone from 10 millimeters to 50, so it's a change of 40 millimeters further away. That's the only condition or parameter we've changed, and look at the difference in the image quality we're getting out of this. We can actually see small particles now on the bottom of the, uh, of the spring. In this example, we're back at our 10 millimeters with our spring. So it's it distorted just like it was in the first example on the left. But here, we change our aperture. And we go from the largest opening, the 100 micrometer opening, to the smallest opening. And again, we get a significant improvement in the depth of the field. We can again see those fine particles on the bottom of the spring. One more time with our example on the left, back at starting conditions, and our optimized conditions now on the right, we have changed both the working distance and the aperture, and we have greatly improved our image quality. So in this sample, we also have the option, or in the, in the SEM, we have the option of tilting the sample to improve it. And what's happening is our on the far left, <clears throat> we have our surface of our sample normal to our beam, and the uh, beam is impinging into it and forming a normal excitation volume. But if we take our sample and tilt it, or take our stage, if you have this capability, tilt the stage, then what happens is the excitation volume is brought closer to the surface. And because it's brought closer to the surface, now the region generating the secondary electrons, we get more secondary electrons being emitted. So they have less solid material to pass through. We have artificially pulled this uh, excitation volume closer. Uh, and just a few degrees of tilt can make an amazing difference in your image quality uh, if you can use the tilt uh, factor. If you don't have a tilting stage, just take your substrate and uh, configure some way to uh, put something under one side of it and tilt it over a little bit. 
we also frequently get asked, how do I tell the difference between a protrusion in a uh, field of view and a depression or a hole? Well, if we have a protrusion, the side of the feature sticking up that is has a direct line of sight to your beam is going to appear brighter than the opposite side of that same feature, just as shown here in this example. The, uh, we, we get the direct line of sight on the right because our detector in this example is sitting up at about 11 o'clock. The uh, side of the feature protrusion on the, uh, from the right side of it, the electrons coming off must go up and then over the top of the, uh, the protrusion. Some of them just aren't going to make it. There'll be many, many fewer uh, secondary electrons escaping and getting to the detector. So this is your example for a protrusion. If this was a depression, the side or edge of the feature closest to your detector this time is going to be your darkest side. Because along that hole or that wall close to the detector, those uh, secondary electrons have to come up and over the edge. You won't get as many of them. The far side now of your hole has a direct line of sight back to your detector and that edge of the feature will now be your brightest. So the two are the opposite. So now if you know where your detector is, you will always know whether or not you're looking at a protrusion or a depression. One other uh, uh, feature that can show up in your secondary electron images is called uh, edge effect. Here you have a surface in your uh, sample or your specimen, uh, a grain of sand or whatever it is, along the edge. It's tilted. It's not normal to the beam. So it's, it's not perpendicular. So it's somewhere in between uh, flat and vertical. Uh, and what has happened is the edge then acts as if you have tilted your sample. Your excitation volume that's closest to that surface has been... Uh, drawn up because of the shape of the feature itself. So now you have a region on your feature where the uh, uh, usable uh, secondary electron, uh, the numbers have greatly increased. So it appears brighter. Take a look at the example. I versus low caving. Uh, the, uh, in the square box on the left, uh, are, this is a 30 kV image. <clears throat> And everything is excessively bright here. All the edges are really lit up. Uh, some of the features in the particle in the center right there are not particularly crisp or sharp. Uh, they're there. You can make them out, yes. Uh, on that inside the box at the right edge of that uh, particle that's in the square, uh, it actually fades away and looks like it's gone. Well, if we lower the accelerating voltage so we're not impinging as deeply, we can decrease the edge effect. You can also turn your current down some. That would be helpful. Uh, but now the particle in the square, you can see there is material there at the right side. Uh, it's now visible. You can see structure on the surface. The excitation volume is back closer to the surface. So we see get more detail. Uh, in their uh, darker areas in that particle, uh, they're, they're, those surfaces are more normal to the beam. And the uh, brighter areas are the slanted sides in this particle. So we're seeing edge effect along that area. Everything, though, is more distinct in this image at 5 kV than it was at 30 kV. Take a look real quickly at uh, microanalysis uh, analyzing x-rays. <clears throat> our goal is to use our x-rays generated by the interaction of the electron beam with the atoms of our sample. And we want to identify the elements. If we're only identifying the elements present, this is referred to as a qualitative analysis. But if we go a step beyond that and try to calculate the weight percents for each of those elements, then that becomes the quantitative analysis. So the x-rays are produced simultaneously now along with your secondary and backscatter electrons. You don't have to do anything particular other than have the right conditions and start the acquisition. X-rays then can be detected by energy dispersive X-ray spectrometry, uh, and uh, typically in the range of 0 to 20 keV if you use the right accelerating voltage. It's also detectable by wavelength. Uh, so now what you're doing is as the X-rays are generated and they move from the point where they're generated to your detectors, they don't just go in a straight line. Uh, it's, it's 
as a sine wave type of pattern to get there. So in the WDS, you are taking a spectrometer and you are optimizing it to look at one X-ray line from one element at a time. It's a slow process. But whether you do EDS or WDS, both can provide you with qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, your analysis methods then can uh, include using of X-ray dot maps or X-ray line scans over two defined points, start to stop. Uh, you can do qualitative or quantitative spectral analysis. You can raster your beam over a set area or your one that you define, whether it be a circle, a square, a rectangle, or one that you randomly draw. Uh, or you can set the uh, analysis to be in a spot mode. Your EDS system can detect all the X-ray lines from the elements uh, that, are, uh, that we can analyze from 0 to 20 kV simultaneously. Uh, 0 to 20 keV, excuse me. Uh, the WDS then is only going to be able to be set up and do one X-ray line from one element individually. It's a long process. Hopefully you won't have too many elements if you're trying to use this one. But uh, a problem with the uh, EDS is it may have too many overlaps for you. How do you resolve them? Well, there's some ways to get around it. One of them is to use the WDS. It very quickly uh, resolves the overlaps in the uh, EDS system, as well as having a better uh, detection limit, at least an order of magnitude for just about all elements. Things to consider. Uh, your analytical conditions. What is going to be the beam energy that you're going to use? <clears throat> if you use a minimum of 15 kV, uh, you'll be able to detect at least one X-ray line for all the elements in, in the EDS spectrum that the instrument can detect between 0 and 10 keV. If you set uh, your beam current uh, high enough, typically you want it such that what's called the dead time is at least 20% or higher. If you have a count rate coming in that's below this, your peak to background ratio is going to be real, very minimal. Your uh, uh, statistics on your analysis uh, is going to be much lower. So you want to get as many counts as you can in a shorter period of time as possible. But what's dead time? <clears throat> Each time an X-ray strikes the detector, it actually turns itself off just very briefly to measure the energy of that X-ray and then stores that X-ray in the proper bin in the EDS spectrum and then turns itself back on. Well, you, <clears throat> it's not uncommon. You're getting count rates of maybe anywhere from 2,000 to 7,000 uh, counts per second or higher, maybe even 50,000 counts per second sometimes. But uh, now in order to generate an X-ray, <clears throat> you have to have what's called an overvoltage. The overvoltage is where you will set the accelerating voltage, and it must be a, a factor of at least 1.5 times greater than the energy of the X-ray you're trying to uh, generate. So if you were trying to look at a copper K-alpha energy line, you're talking about 8 uh, keV for the copper X-ray, you would have to have a beam accelerating voltage of a minimum of uh, 12 keV, so one and a half times. Uh, where possible, I like to use a factor of two instead of just one and a half, because uh, when you're starting to get near the end of the limit of what you can detect, uh, you can count, uh, get a lot more counts in less time uh, very easily by having that uh, additional boost in your accelerating voltage. Uh, you need to consider your sample. Is it homogeneous? If it's not, you may have to have multiple analyses from multiple points uh, over uh, maybe a wide area. You have to evaluate each one and set it up to do that. Your peaks may overlap. These can be difficult to resolve, but if you uh, uh, maybe get a little bit of training in this area, and this is a uh, uh, the EDS spectrum or X-ray analysis is is a is a big topic, and and it, it will take some work to really be able to do it all well and get it right every time. But it's possible. But uh, the peak overlaps will certainly have to be considered all the time. It's possible to have contamination within your sample, or you may get scattering of electrons in your chamber due to non-conductive samples, and they may strike uh, 
the surface outside of your uh, analysis area, and you may be generating signals from the uh, SEM itself. Maybe the maybe your uh, the mount that you've uh, put it on. If you use an aluminum pin, you might be getting aluminum in a spectrum where there should be no aluminum, or you might be getting iron from the steel chamber. All these things would have to be considered and evaluated. Your software then will have some options available to you, one of which is going to be the correction method that you're going to use to convert your qualitative analysis to your uh, quantitative analysis. Uh, one of the routines that's often available, and you may have the option to choose different ones, uh, one of them is called ZAF. And the Z stands for a correction for the atomic number, uh, which element is being present in your sample. The A is the absorption, and how many of the x-rays are being absorbed and lost. Or fluorescence, you're getting secondary uh, fluorescence coming out of this, maybe from another element, you don't know. But you also have the option then in your software that you might choose to use the manufacturer references to convert your data from qualitative to quantitative, or you may want to set up and define your own standards. Uh, it's a complicated process and uh, probably not uh, something the beginner wants to take on right away. So here's our uh, uh, peak, uh, or spectrum rather, and this is just an example of a titanium. But one of the things in the EDS spectrum that you need to always consider are what's what's called artifacts. Uh, in this example, it's a piece of titanium, and over towards the right of the spectrum, there's a label there that's called TI sum. Well, that's a titanium sum peak. It doesn't show up very well in this example. So is it there? Is it not there? Is it misidentified? And uh, auto-ident routines have been known to misidentify a few uh, peaks, but uh, you as the operator then have to verify each of these. If we take that spectrum and convert it from a linear scale to a log scale, we can indeed see there is a titanium sum peak. Well, what is a titanium sum peak? We have our main uh, titanium uh, K alpha peak at 4.5 keV. What has happened is two titanium K alpha peak, uh, X rays have struck the detector simultaneously, and the uh, detector does not know that it's two X rays. It sees the total combined energy. So now it is not 4.5. It is one X-ray energy at nine. So it's 4.5 times two. If we had uh, back here, uh, uh, we have a small peak on silicon. If that silicon had a much higher concentration, it'd be a much bigger peak. But if it was a much bigger peak, any of your major peaks then are really subject to giving you some peaks. So a sum peak might be like two titanium x-rays striking the detector simultaneously. And if that was a big silicon peak, you might get a two silicon peak strike, uh, two silicon x-ray striking it simultaneously. Or you may get one silicon and one titanium x-ray striking it simultaneously, and now you have a different uh, sum peak. So you can get three different sum peaks out of that if you just had two elements. Uh, the escape peak for titanium is right here in between two and three. What an escape peak is, is the titanium uh, K-alpha X-ray has struck the detector, and uh, this is a silicon detector, and in doing so, it's it uh, creates a, a pair of uh, electron pair, and they will migrate through the, the crystal and then on to be de measured and detected. Well, what could happen is these electron pairs, one of the two electrons may become close to an edge and actually escape the, uh, the crystal, and then it's lost. The result is you have the uh, X-ray that struck the detector at 4.5 loses the equivalent of a silicon X-ray, which is 1.7, and now you get escape peaks 1.7 keV below your main peak, or in this case, 2.8 keV. And uh, you can get rid of some of these artifacts maybe by decreasing your count rate. Turn the uh, amount of current down if, if you have that luxury. Drop your accelerating voltage if that's a possibility. But uh, you can adjust for it. If you can't, then just make sure you account for them properly. If you try to identify some of these uh, peaks, if, they're, if your software does not label them, and not all manufacturers label every summer escape peak, uh, you may spend and waste a lot of time trying to identify some strange peak. Here we have a quantitative result. This is uh, 
uh, done on a steel standard. Uh, and again, uh, in this spectrum, we have uh, molybdenum identified over here just above 2 keV. And then there's a couple more labels for uh, molybdenum out here between 15 and 20, but we don't see a peak. Is there something really there? The reason this might come up as a question is because the um, peak that we see for molybdenum back at, uh, you know, just under two and a half there, this is an area that has a lot of interference. Um, lead, uh, M-line forms an X-ray right there, as well as the sulfur K-line. This is the molybdenum L-line. So there's three elements piled on top of one another, possibly in that same region. Well, is moly present or not? Flip to the log scale. We can see out here now at 17.4 keV, we do have a peak for molybdenum. It is in the right place. And we look at our spectral results, we see that our uh, molybdenum result uh, in that second column has been created or generated based upon the peak uh, in the L series. So that's the one back here at about two and a half. Uh, you've got your most counts there. You'll get your better statistics from there. So you verify that the peaks are being identified correctly. What you also want to look for is whether or not all peaks have been identified. If we look right here a little about uh, just about 8 keV, right there on the left shoulder of that uh, nickel K-beta line, it looks like it has a, a, some type of a shoulder to it. Is it a doublet or what's going on? Well, actually, 8 keV, the uh, uh, element that comes in right here is the copper, and it would be the copper K-alpha line. And this particular steel actually does have a small amount of copper added to it. Well, in this particular case, it's not been identified. You would have to test it out and find out, is that truly copper? Or maybe count longer or do something additional. Maybe use lower KV, expand the scale, and see if you get the copper L line being formed down here. That area gets quite busy. It may not really be distinguishable, but it might be another way to check. Significant returns. The SEM operator will be able to uh, make informed, knowledgeable decisions about how to set up and adjust your SEM to obtain better information in less time. You also have an operator now that's no longer frustrated. They will be a much happier worker. A couple of important items to remember. The optimum conditions for imaging are not necessarily the same as the optimum conditions for elemental analysis. Often the two can be contradictory. We need high KV for one, low KV for another. High spot size for one, low spot size for another. Uh, and also, changing any one setting to improve a result in one area will certainly change the result or degrade the signal in another area. I want to thank uh, JOL USA and Oxford Instruments for giving us permission to use some of their diagrams in our training sessions here. Uh, they've been very helpful and supportive to us over the years. And we have some it's, uh, Yeah, we have uh, just this slide here just shows some of our uh, upcoming courses and, of course, uh, future mm -hmm. webinars. And I'd like to thank Joe today for... Uh, very informative session and um, looks like we have some questions if you have some questions that you would like to ask Joe at this time go ahead and type them into the question field and we will uh, we'll start answering them so the first uh, couple questions looks like it pertains to the availability of this presentation and you know in the future and this webinar uh, was being recorded and will be available, the entire recording, on our website under the Webinars tab, along with a transcript, a, a PDF of the entire presentation. So those will appear in about a week's time on our website. Okay, Brandon has um, a question. Could you explain a little more about the reasons for dead time? Okay, once an X-ray strikes the detector and it measured the energy of it, the electronics and the computer has to stop and uh, uh, store that X-ray. 
and it just flat turns itself off and it cannot receive incoming x-rays. It's it's extremely short period. You're talking you know microseconds here, but uh, it that the software then is measuring it, uh, determining the energy and putting it in the proper place in your EDS spectrum. And like I say, this can be uh, 2,000 times a second or 50,000 times a second. It is very fast. But what happens is you, you create this dead time. You set up a condition where you want your analysis to run for 100 seconds of live time. Well, live time is only the time that the detector is actually available to measure x-rays. So the total analysis time or clock time becomes a combination of the live time plus the dead time. So now if we have, let's say, 25% dead time set up for an analysis uh, because of the number of counts coming in, and we count, uh, we tell it to count for 100 seconds of live time, the actual time it's going to take is going to be the 100 seconds plus 25 seconds of dead time, or on your watch, it's going to be uh, 125 seconds or two minutes and five seconds for the whole analysis, start to finish. Uh, does that help, Brandon? Mm -hmm. yeah, and then kind of related to that, Joe, we, we have uh, another question from Joe. What, is there a rule of thumb for a high limit for dead time? Uh, yes. Uh, if you have uh, the old style S, uh, silicon detectors, the silicon lithium drifted detectors, it is possibly to, uh, possible to harm these things and destroy them because your count rate gets too high. Uh, the manufacturers used to show the display of the dead time in, in a, uh, by color. If it was green, you were in the safe zone. If it turned yellow, your count rate was becoming too high. And if it got red, you were subject to damaging your crystal. Uh, what you're creating is, you know, you, you've got, again, an electron signal going on here. So you've got heat being generated in the old detectors, the silly type detectors. Uh, you could actually make that crystal become so hot, even though it's being liquid nitrogen cooled, it would become so hot that you could drive the lithium out of your detector. And now your $10,000 detector, it, it just became worth zero. Uh, in the SDD, you're going to have other complications. You can drive it up to 50, 60, 70 percent if you choose. But if you get count rates this high, what you have to be thinking of then is the EDS artifacts. Some of the manufacturers try to compensate for this by what they call pulse pileup routines, and they try to subtract it out. Uh, in some areas, it, it works fine, but maybe in the region for other elements and other x-rays, uh, you know, it doesn't work so good. And you come up with peaks that you just cannot identify. Okay. Ed is asking, is it common to find high carbon on a stainless steel sample using EDS? Yes, you can find it. Uh, even at 30 kV, you'll probably end up with carbon in your EDS spectrum. Uh, it'll be a very small peak because most of your excitation volume then is subsurface. But if you drop the accelerating voltage, if you want to know if there's, is there carbon on the surface, drop your accelerating voltage. Bring it down. If you started the first analysis at 30, and now you do an analysis at 20. If the carbon uh, is, is from a, a residue on the surface, and uh, we'll get back to that in a second, but if it's from the surface, you should get a higher uh, quantitative result for carbon because more of the excitation volume is now closer at 20 kV than it was at 30. Uh, what you're doing is a poor man's depth profile by dropping the kV. If you continue to drop it, you go to 10 kV, the carbon result could become even larger. Uh, see, I lost my train of thought there on the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, go to, there's one um, here, Joe, uh, kind of regarding sample size. Uh, how fine of a sample do you need uh, to analyze um, in, in, this, in the SEM? Well, as far as the you know, width and length of it, it, it can be almost any area. I mean, you can blow, you, you, you can limit your raster area. Uh, down to something that is sub-micrometer. Uh, but depending upon the accelerating voltage you're trying to use now, if you're looking at a quarter of a micron particle, and I have in some cases, do not expect to get good quantitative results because the bulk of your excitation volume is not being contained within that quarter micrometer particle. You can identify maybe the major and the uh, minor elements that are present 
and get a rough approximation of the relationship between them. But uh, it's not going to be good for uh, uh, all types of analysis. The, uh, the particles, like I say, I've, I've looked at particles and gotten some hints of the, what's present in them below a tenth of a micrometer. But it's, it's, it's not accurate information, so don't treat it as such. Okay. If you have a constant accelerating voltage, does changing the spot size have an effect on the interaction volume? What you're going to, okay, the interaction volume size will stay the same. What's going to happen is you, when you change the spot size, if you increase it, yes, it becomes a little bit larger. But you, all, all that's going to happen is you're going to lose a little bit of image quality. You may or may not notice it depending upon your magnification. But you're putting more electrons into the surface of the sample and pinching into it. And what you're going to do is create more x-rays in any given uh, second or time period. So uh, it, it, you lose a little image quality, but not much. You gain a lot of uh, x-ray counts and you get much, much better statistics. Question from Jason. Any tips for imaging objects that experience motion when excited by an electron beam? Uh, <laughs> code it. <laughs> that's, that's one thing. Now, one of the things to be cautious of, if uh, you are looking at a specimen and, uh, in your field of view and it is very slowly look like it's drifting out of the center and going to one of the edges, you need to realize this sample is itself is not moving. This sample here is stationary. <clears throat> and what you're actually seeing is the sample is charging. It is not fully conductive. And because it is building up a negative charge, it is repelling the beam as it's coming in. <clears throat> so it's being deflected away from the initial area that you tried to analyze. And you're now rastering with a bent beam an area slightly adjacent uh, to your field of view. If you uh, drop your magnification down significantly, you'll see your uh, field of view uh, where you started walk back to the center of your screen. So uh, maybe try some coding. Okay. You can try, you know, if, you, if you can't adjust the accelerating voltage, uh, you know, if it's possible to drop it down lower, turn your current down some more, you can uh, compensate for some of this, but you'll eventually get to a point where you can't, and coding then becomes the only way. Okay. Is the edge effect really just a result of different saturation curves for the edge versus the flat section? Yeah, you've got the, you know, your excitation volume, the surface of the portion of it that is generating the beam of uh, the secondary electrons that are going to be able to escape. Uh, there, it's, it's a bigger area when, the, uh, when it's close to the edge. So it's the equivalent of tilting the sample. Uh, it's just artificially, you've instantly got the sample tilted. Okay. Um, going back uh, to the topic of dead time, uh, you mentioned that dead time needs to be around greater than 20%. Isn't that uh, make pulse pile up increase? Uh, not so terribly. It, it, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, 20, 25% is, is a very good uh, count rate. Uh, a, a, an example of dead time because now you uh, if you go much lower your uh, peak to noise ratio is going to become atrocious and your statistics then on the measurement become much greater and uh, this is not what you want you know ideally if you're doing quantitative work you know the world was perfect you'd like to have all your uncertainties at 1% or less okay is there a recommended minimum or maximum magnification for EDS analysis? No. You can analyze uh, whatever conditions your SEM will uh, 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 be able to be adjusted to. Uh, if, if you have a very large sample, you know, several inches or six inches in size, I mean, you could do that analysis at, uh, at, you know, at 30 kV or 30 uh, X magnification and you're just acquiring spectra from the full field of view that you're rastering over. Uh, if you want to get smaller, you, you just start zooming in. And you're, when you increase the magnification in the SEM, what you're actually doing is you're limiting the length of the raster from uh, point A to point B, and then uh, you're taking the area that the image is being projected on and dividing it by the raster length. 
So now as you get shorter and shorter in your raster length, your magnification is being increased. Okay, uh, going back again to the topic of dead time, yeah. are there uh, any disadvantages for, or what are the disadvantages for a low dead time? Uh, it, you just don't have enough signal coming in. You're, you're going to have very poor counting statistics. If you want to have smooth uh, uh, spectra, uh, good peaks, uh, you're going to have to count for a long time. And that uh, the uncertainty is just going to be there, very high. Can you live with? Can you live with a 25 to 50 percent uncertainty? You know, this this is the point where you got to be thinking about: Is that element even present? Is this real? What's the uh, accuracy of this measurement? It's not going to be real good. Okay, from uh, Brandon here again. Um, are there any settings, operating conditions that can be adjusted to affect the sharpness of your EDX peaks? Uh, not really affecting the sharpness of the peaks, but in the software routines, you may have a smoothing effect, and this may or may not be available in all uh, from all the manufacturers. It's just an artificial smoothing out of the of the peak. Uh, if you want to uh, just have it run longer, it'll become smoother like that. You know, if you do a two-second acquisition versus a, a hundred-second acquisition, the uh, sharpness of the peaks will look a lot different. I think that uh, that about does it for the questions, Joe. Um, again, thanks for uh, a very informative webinar. And um, we're going to be doing another webinar here in two weeks, February 4th. Our presenter for that webinar will be Scott Stoffler of Macron Associates. And Scott's presentation is titled, Identifying Foreign Particulate in Pharmaceutical Products. We hope to see you out here for that in a couple weeks and thanks again for attending.